Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry lab video covers the hydroboration oxidation of one octene experiment. This is part four, carrying out the oxidation reaction and characterizing the reaction mixture by GC, gas chromatography analysis. Safety for this week's experiments covered on this slide. We'll be working with a three molar solution of sodium hydroxide, which is somewhat caustic and irritating to skin, so you should avoid skin contact with that reagent. Wear gloves. We'll also be working with 30% hydrogen peroxide, which is a strong oxidant and can cause skin burn, so you should definitely wear gloves when working with that material. Furthermore, hydrogen peroxide reacts with many organic compounds, including acetone, to form explosive peroxide, so it's really important that all peroxide waste be handled properly and not disposed in the acetone waste jugs. There'll be special waste containers put out for the hydrogen peroxide waste that you generate today. Finally, use care when working with needles. In this experiment, we'll be using two reagents. The first one is 3 molar NaOH, sodium hydroxide, and the second one is 30% aqueous hydrogen peroxide. Your reaction mixture from last week contains THF and the product mixture in a round bottom flask. You should put a stir bar in your round bottom flask, put that on a stir plate, and get that stirring. Then we'll dispense the sodium hydroxide reagent using a one milliliter syringe and stainless steel needle. Withdraw 0.60 milliliters of this reagent and then inject that into the reaction mixture with stirring. Next, we'll add the 30% hydrogen peroxide. This is a reminder to use caution with this reagent because it's very corrosive and a strong oxidant. You should definitely wear gloves when you're transferring this reagent. Draw up 0.60 milliliters of the 30% hydrogen peroxide solution in a syringe and needle. Be sure to use a clean syringe and needle and add that to the reaction mixture slowly over 10 minutes with stirring. The idea with adding it slow is that the reaction won't overheat prematurely. Once the reagents have been added, we'll actually need to heat the reaction to get it to proceed at a reasonable rate. Lower the reaction mixture into a water bath on the hot plate. Then we'll add a reflux condenser. The condenser plugs into the top of the round bottom flask and sits vertically. Cooling water should go in through the bottom of the apparatus and come out the top barb of the condenser. This allows air bubbles to escape. The point of a reflux condenser is to keep solvent in the apparatus. In refluxing, we want to make the solution hot to get the reaction to go faster, but we don't want to lose the solvent. The reflux condenser will capture solvent and allow us to keep it in the vessel. We're using a hot water bath here as a heat source. Sometimes you'll use a heating mantle, perhaps an oil bath, or maybe a sand bath. But here a hot water bath is good because the temperature won't get any higher than 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of water. That's what we're looking for here, a mild heat source. Tetrahydrofuran boils at 65 degrees Celsius, so this is plenty of heat to get the solvent to boil to reflux. When the apparatus heats up, you should see boiling solvent in the vessel. You should also see the vapor climbing up inside the apparatus inside the condenser and condensing a third of the way up at most and then falling back down. This is called a reflux ring. You can see where the vapor and liquid interface is. This is the highest point that the vapor climbs in the reflux apparatus. If it gets much higher, one half the height of the condenser or even higher, you're adding too much heat at the bottom. You should back that off so that you don't risk losing the solvent out the top of the condenser. After refluxing for one hour, remove the heat source by taking away the hot water bath and then we can cool it down to room temperature fairly quickly by replacing the hot water bath with a room temperature water bath. This will get the reaction temperature down to near room temperature very quickly. When the reaction is cooled, you can remove the condenser and then retrieve the stir bar using this magnetic stir bar retriever. Essentially, this is just a magnet on a stick. This will allow you to pluck the stir bar out. In the next step, transfer the reaction mixture into a point bottom test tube. These are sometimes called centrifuge tubes. Then rinse the round bottom flask with two milliliters of diethyl ether and add the diethyl ether to the point bottom test tube. The test tube will have two phases now. There's a lower aqueous layer which contains the peroxide and hydroxide, and then there's an upper layer that contains ether and the dissolved organic materials, including the products. Remove the lower aqueous layer and discard it. Next, we'll add 1.5 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution of HCl to the centrifuge tube and agitate it. The point of this is to remove any sodium hydroxide that might be left. Again, remove the lower aqueous layer and discard it. Next, we'll add 1.5 milliliters of water to the centrifuge tube, agitate it, allow the layers to separate, and then remove the lower layer and discard it. Next, pour the solution into a clean dry vial. We'll dry the product mixture with magnesium sulfate. To add enough magnesium sulfate to make a thin layer on the bottom of the vial, you'll know you've added enough if you swirl it and the magnesium sulfate remains free flowing. After the mixture has sat for a while, we'll filter off the magnesium sulfate using a microfiltration apparatus. This consists of a small pipette with a little bit of cotton jammed into the tip. 
push the cotton down into the tip of the pipette, clamp it to a ring stand, and then pipette the mixture through into a clean, dry, pre-weighed vial. The cotton will filter out any magnesium sulfate that gets into the pipette. When the filtration is complete, we'll need to remove the solvents. Bring the vial over to the fume hood and blow a gentle stream of air into it while you heat it on a sand bath. We'll know that we're done with the evaporation when the vial stops changing in mass. So periodically put it on the balance, weigh it, and see what its mass is. When it stops changing, you'll know you're done. The products in today's experiment, the alcohols, are very high boiling and there's no risk that they're going to evaporate. What we're getting rid of here is the ether and the tetrahydrofuran. A typical mass for reaction mixture in this experiment is 0.19 grams. We'll need to dilute our sample to analyze it by GC. It's too concentrated to inject directly into the GC instrument. So dilute one drop of your reaction mixture in 0.5 milliliters of acetone. Finally, we'll be analyzing the reaction mixture by gas chromatography, or GC. GC was covered extensively in a previous video. If you're a little fuzzy on how it works or how to operate the GC instrument, check out that prior video and remind yourself of how it all works. Here we're just going to go over the basics and review the general operation. The injector port on the GC is on the top of the instrument. Push the needle of the syringe until it bottoms out, then press the plunger down to inject the sample. Press start on the GC instrument and then press start on the computer on Logger Pro to get the data station collecting data. The retention times of standards are shown on this slide. And this slide shows the chromatogram of the reaction mixture. Here, retention times are highlighted in yellow and integration values are outlined in red. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.